For downloading episode number 50 of the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz. On this episode, I spoke with three artists who have new music to speak of and are doing very interesting things in general, and those are Stacy Jones, Tommy Lee, and Jeff Rosenstock. First up is my interview with Jeff Rosenstock. Now, I have to give a little bit of a disclaimer here. I've known Jeff for over 20 years. I'm in my late 30s. So that means that I've known Jeff since I was in high school. I used to go see his band play when I was in high school. They were called the Arrogant Sons of Bitches, or ASOB. And that evolved into his work in the also acclaimed Bomb the Music Industry. But Jeff has really found his own as a solo artist and a composer in recent years. We haven't been keeping up as much as we should have been over the years in recent years because he's become a really in-demand busy artist. But the key here is that he's doing great work that's being internationally recognized. He's really in demand. And maybe I let my guard down a little too much in this interview. I think you see a different side of me than usual where, yes, I'm complimenting, but I'm also letting the goofiness prevail. So (laughs) I can't guarantee you're gonna like this one, but I can guarantee that you're gonna really like and respect Jeff Rosenstock if you don't already. Jeff, how's it going there today? Ah, uh, you know, it's going all right. How are you doing? Nonstop, but good here as far as I know, unless you know something I don't know, which wouldn't be the first time. About you? About what's up with you? Yeah, that that has happened over the years, but... <laughs> <laughs> so congrats about the new album. It's pretty amazing that you were able to pull off kind of a surprise again. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I, you know, that's how I am just trying to do stuff, at least at this point. It makes... The whole uh, album, I don't know, the whole album rollout thing is something that I feel like I don't, I don't don't really understand that much anyway, you know? How long had it been in the making for? Because again, I didn't know it was happening. I had been writing it for a long time. Like some of these songs are, are before, there's definitely songs in here that were written like during recording post or before recording post. Some of them like got started before worry even so like i was working on writing it for a really long time and uh yeah we just we recorded it in february and i and we always at at this point we kind of just try to do uh just not tell anybody what we're doing when we're doing it because that seems more fun to me than or or not more fun but that just seems more natural to me than like doing pre-release hype or whatever, and be like, oh, here we are in the studio. What could it be that we're doing? Uh oh, you know, like I, I feel goofy doing something like that. Uh, but just putting it out, like, okay, it's more. I guess I, I feel goofy doing something like that, but not goofy being like, all right, we're undercover. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> you know. But it sounds very cohesive to me, almost like it was your take on the decline by no effects. So. Oh. Uh, it's not, but that's cool. <laughs> well, big, big tune, big tune, the decline. Is it 18 minutes? And if I remember correctly, you could play the whole thing in order. Uh, oh, we tried, uh, Bond the Music Industry tried at a house show in Mississippi, uh, like after the show we played at the house. I think we tried to play the decline by memory and we got like 11 minutes into it and I couldn't remember the next part. We're like, ah, fuck, so close. Well, a thing about you in watching you for, oh man, it's over 20 years now, is you always had a memory for lyrics. You know, your songs don't just have, you know, here's verse one, here's verse two, then verse three is the same as verse two, kind of like the Ramones. So... It's interesting to see that your songs have become a little more simple or focused over the years. Has that been a kind of a conscious thing that you did? 
No, I don't think so. I think of just I think of just trying to write. I, maybe it's just listening to more power pop and trying to write songs, you know, that are just kind of the songs that are like similar to the songs that I like listening to, you know. Um, I I don't know. I I bet like just listening to like power pop or pop punk is is maybe the reason things tightened up a little bit. But like as far as I don't know, I still don't really feel like I've like it's particularly conventional because it does change. Like I don't know. I and it's not even something like I do intentionally. Like I but I realized at some point when when I was like talking to the label about like well what song do we put out first or whatever just like the second half of this record doesn't really have a chorus at any point that repeats until the, until the last song. Like there's no, in, in this weird way where I was like, all right, I made this catchy thing. It's like, wait, there's not really a chorus in like the second half of it. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not like, there's no like, uh, you know, all right, I'm trying to tighten up my song craft or anything like that. I, I do feel like it's easier to write uh like kind of like a pop punk song or a power pop song now and not feel gross about it because people just don't really care about that kind of music as much anymore. It kind of makes you feel a little bit freer to like, I don't know, write something super catchy and not feel like you're trying to write like a fucking jingle for like a car company or something, you know? <laughs> I, I thought, you know, playing weird therapist interviewer guy that it was going to be that scoring a hundred episodes of a TV show kind of got you down to the bare bones of realizing, okay, 17 seconds, we can do 17 seconds. <laughs> it, it told, you know, it, that's like a hundred percent true to that. Like, as far as like, there's a bunch of shorter songs in this record. And that is cause like, I don't know if I want to sneak like a song into Craig of the Creek, it's got to be 10 to 15 seconds long and get everything done in that 10 to 15 seconds uh, or else it's not going in there. Uh, Cause I don't know. They don't, they don't ever really ask me to do songs that there will, there will just be a montage and I'll just be like, well, I can make a punk song this amount of time. Was it scoring it that led you to move out to Los Angeles? I actually have no idea when you moved to LA or why you moved to LA. Uh, we moved in January. That was a big part of it. Um, uh, it was a lot of things, uh, you know, New York, I, I don't know. It just felt like it was, it was time, uh, to do it. And I, I was scoring this show and I feel like if I've ever like had any opportunity, like, I don't know, I feel like this is probably the one opportunity in my life that one, I'll get to be a part of something I I, oh, I guess it's like one that like I could possibly be like, hey, I like score a cartoon. Maybe I could move this into scoring a movie or something like that, which is something I've always wanted to do. And I haven't really done that in the traditional way. So I feel like if I didn't do that now, uh, I don't know when that would happen. But even more importantly to me, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's nice to be out here and be a part of like what is happening with Craig of the Creek and like have it not be a thing where like, I don't know. They had like a party for their hundredth episode and it was nice to be here for it instead of be like, Oh, well I'm in New York. Uh, and that's just cause the show and the crew and everything that everyone's doing is like a real, I don't know. It seems like a lightning in a bottle moment. It seems really special. It feels really special to be in it. So it was just like a lot of that. My sister and my brother, uh, my brother was out here. My sister is out here with her kid and I've got friends out here and you know, we had a small apartment, in Greenpoint, which was not, a, which was like not even that small by like New York standards. Um, but being in there in like a tiny room scoring, I think I did like 75 or 76 episodes of Craig of the Creek and like a room that's like the size that you could fit a bed in. And that's it. If you were going to use it as a bedroom and like doing mail order from a third floor walk up and having like pallets of records dropped just on the street and like trying to and moving like a ton of records of it downstairs. Uh, there are things that like, it felt like we had, uh, that, that were becoming just kind of like, you know what, this is, we can do this and it's fine to do this, but maybe it's time to not do this this way for a little bit. You know, does that make sense? It always makes sense from you. There, now, now we're going to enter the compliment <laughs> Jeff portion of the interview. No, 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 no. Oh, no. I was actually going to compliment you on a few things in a row and see how you take them. And the first one okay. is when I interviewed Chris Gethard a year or two ago, 
and your name came up, he said that he goes to you every time he kind of wants to figure out what's the right indie thing to do. Uh, do you That's know that? funny. Yeah, yeah. He's talked to me about stuff before. I go to him too. We, we, uh, me and Chris uh, both lived when Chris lived in Greenpoint. Uh, we we were both people who, because of our jobs, like you know, at one o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday, we'd both be free. So a lot of the times we'd just like get lunch and talk about like. And I think, and both of our careers, I hate to use that word, but both of like the things that we were doing were taking off in a different way at that time. And I think it was very comforting to be able to talk to each other and keep each other in check. Um, you know, uh, yeah, as, as Chris has done that, I've done that with Chris as well. And it feels like an honor because that dude is good. When exactly did you two meet? I went to an episode of the Chris Gethard show with um, our friends, Eric and Val, who do merch for us. Um, I went to sandwich night and I met Chris then. And we, you know, we got along. They were friends with Eric and Chris was friends with Eric and Val. So we met and uh, then I don't know. I probably said like, I want to be on the show. I want to like, I don't know. I wanted, I, I want to play the show. I think I, I think that might have been the one that Slater Kenny was on too. I know I went to the Slater Kenny Chris Gethard show too. It was just like, wow, this is amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, and then we were on the show, and then uh, we, and then our episode of the show, Chris was very sick that day, and our band ended up doing. It was. It's a more difficult thing to explain than if you just see the episode of our show. You'll see it like that we, it went off the rails in a way uh, that we both did together. And uh, yeah, I think we've been friends ever since that. I'm going to be doing some homework and looking that up. I wasn't sure though, being that it's, he's, it's weird, he's <laughs> relatively close to our age. So I wasn't sure if, Oh, well he'd been in an ASOB show in 2002 or something like that. No. And he's like a New Jersey punk kid too. And I think we just, I don't know. I mean, I like, I, especially, around like ASOB era. Like I wasn't really, I, you know, I was like friends with my friends, but I was not like, you know, particularly extroverted socially. Like I, I feel like I had my friends and I was happy that I had my friends and anyone else who spoke to me kind of scared me, you know? <laughs> Yet a lot of the people that you went to NYU with, you wound up working with long-term in some form or another. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, Tim, who was my roommate was like the drummer in my band uh, until it became like a touring band. And then Kevin, uh, played on the record and, and it was awesome to have Kevin, but like this, the band that I, that we're doing the solo band, like wouldn't have existed without Tim, that Chris Gethard show saying like all the funny stuff we did that day was like Tim's idea. Uh, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still buds with people, I guess from NYU. Not that I, I don't, I don't feel like it works super close with a lot of them, but like, yeah. Well, another thing that's kind of unique about you is that you're too kind of childhood slash college bands both went on to be kind of cult bands that people want to reunite all the time. Are those chapters of your life that you ever see revisiting, even if it's just for holiday shows? I guess. Yeah. I, I don't really like, I, I, with bomb, it's a thing where like for a bomb reunion to make sense, it would have to be a show that would be free that a lot of people could go to, uh, because, that that's just that's the only way that would make sense for me uh and i don't like i don't see a way for that to really be something uh and asob like we did reunion shows i don't really feel like we need to do more reunion shows or anything like it felt really good about the ones we did the warsaw and to me that feels like that closed that chapter but you know i don't know i like it's not something I ever think about doing. I try to really just stay focused on what's happening in my life right now. I'm, I'm like, I'm plenty overwhelmed without adding that extra stuff into it. Um, but that isn't to say that like at some point, uh, when things inevitably slow down in my life that, you know what I mean? It's not something I'm thinking about, but it's, you know, I don't know. I feel like it's similar to, uh, Fugazi saying they went on a hiatus even though like they haven't fucking played a show in like 20 years. Right. I was seeing it along the lines of a Mike Patton kind of situation where, you know, when he gets up and does faith, no more songs from the early nineties, that's not what he really wants to do, but the reaction of that, you know, drives that home. 
And then Mr. Bungle, people want to see that. And again, he's pushing the, uh, the ball forward with weirdo scoring kind of projects and death metal things that, you know, a thousand people are going to hear. But at the end of the day, he goes, well, I want to earn a living and it makes people happy. So I'm going to do it. I was kind of projecting that on you a little bit. <laughs> Oh, I, I think it's pretty sick that Mr. Bungle uh, reunited and played their first demo. Like, that's such a fucking, that's such like, a, I don't know, a good piss take, I guess. Or it's just like, all right, we're getting back together, played our first demo, and that's it. <laughs> and he sold out three shows at Brooklyn Steel. Yeah, yeah, people want to see him. Uh, I, I think, you know, this might be projecting onto what other people are doing, and I'm sure it's because it brings people joy, but I think that a lot of the reasons people do those things is just because it's more commercially viable and they're like, okay, cool, let's make some money. Let's do this. And not even really in like a, you know, in a, in a, in, in a like exploitative way of their audience. Like it makes people happy. Uh, and you know, they're like, Oh, we could play big festivals now and it'll be sick. Even though Faith the more was always very popular. But I don't know. Uh, just, but that whole aspect of it to me is not like, that isn't something that really, crosses my mind it seems like it would be definitely antithetical to everything bomb stood for so it's like you know if you do if if you would do something like that i feel like it would have to be a hundred percent right because you're also just fucking with fucking with the time capsule you know what i mean you're trying to sneak something in there after it's already buried fucking with the time capsule might be in a, a name of something right there so don't forget that one so bring it okay, back yeah. to, bring it back to right now that's my that's my podcast about uh trying to adjust the past <laughs> works for me and with this new album you're like every other artist where you're kind of stuck in limbo with touring not happening and Productions for scoring is probably slowed down for the most part. But no, that's that's exactly the same. Well, what's coming up for you? Do you have things booked in November, or December, or are you just waiting to see? Uh, we're just waiting to see at this point. Uh, I mean, we have we have all kinds of things booked, but we just keep canceling them and moving them forward. So, uh, you know, we're just kind of waiting to see when we can play shows again and when we'll be safe. And uh, it's frustrating for sure, but. Uh, you know, what can you do? Everybody's in it together. I just, uh, yeah, I, I have hope that when it comes back, it'll be, it'll be cool and people will feel happy to be able to go to a concert or show again, you know? Well, you seem to be holding up fine. That's, that's a positive part to it because a lot of people we see on social media have kind of lost it a little bit. You still have that sanity in the DIY ethic <laughs> in your messages. <laughs> I don't know who social media you lo you're looking at, but I, don't, I feel like I've lost my fucking mind uh, the last, uh, especially the last two weeks watching uh, like, you know, police violently uh, brutalize protesters who are protesting against our racist police state. Uh, I feel like I'm starting to lose it a little bit, to be honest with you. Uh, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, all things considered, I'm holding up fine. As far as like a band and financially or whatever, we're lucky to have a really, uh, I don't know. People have been supportive. People have been donating. Uh, people are, you know, when we put stuff up to try and make money to get everyone in the band, a couple hundred extra bucks or something, people are chipping in and helping out. So we're lucky there. As far as what's going on in the world though, uh, no, I'm not fine. <laughs> Things are scary and terrifying. Okay, let's compare you to the singer of Trapped. Who has been holding up better on social media for the past month? I haven't, like, dug into Trapped's Twitter account too much, but I just see, like, friends of mine be like, yo, fucking the guy from Trapped blocked me. Good. It's like a, it's like a badge of honor. And I'm just like, I, this guy seems like, I don't know. I don't know. He probably, it seems like he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. Does it help or hurt the fact that his name is Chris Brown? Oh, I didn't know that either. Uh, that, that doesn't help because Chris Brown is a piece of shit. <laughs> Something in the name right there. <laughs> so being mindful of your time here, I'll ask the closer, and that's any last words for the kids? I guess any message for anybody who's listening out there is that, you know, keep being loud about the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Like it's, this is going to be 
a long fight, uh, but it's important to have well, saying it's important. Like there's no way to articulate it because it's so fucking important. Like this is right now, this can be the fight where we make real changes in America and get rid of systemic racism. So keep it up, stay loud, keep protesting, keep signing petitions, keep screaming about it, keep doing everything you can, keep educating yourself, keep talking to people, uh, you know, and don't like, you know, don't, if you were, if you felt activated in the first week of protests, don't, you know, don't let that die. Black Lives Matter. Next up is my interview with Stacy Jones. Like the other two in this episode, it was also recorded in June of 2020, a confusing time for all of us. But Stacy is somebody that I've been a fan of for over 20 years. I think that's going to be a theme here in this episode. I say that because, yes, I'm a fan of American Hi-Fi, which has been Stacy's band for 20-ish years. Before that, Letters to Cleo and Veruca Salt and the work he did with Nina Gordon. Currently, he's in Matchbox 20. I think he's still working with Miley Cyrus. He's one of those guys that has a lot of projects going on at any given time. We spoke a lot about that. This guy was as nice as they come. Um, The first time I interviewed him, I think I was 19 years old. 2001 when the single flavor of the week by American Hi-Fi was first taken off I'd seen them a couple months before that opening up for super drag I think the band had just got in their record deal and it's really cool when you meet somebody on the way up and they're really nice you meet them after they have that supposed commercial peak and they're still really really nice and after doing this interview a couple people that I know It came up that I'd spoken with Stacey and they went, oh man, I love that guy. Everyone seems to love Stacey Jones. That's gonna come through really quickly. If you wanna see the video of this interview, it is up on YouTube. You'll see the trampoline that we're talking about a little bit. But one thing I haven't yet mentioned is that Stacey has a new band with his wife called Atwater Punks, P-U-N-X. It is a new musical direction for him. And he also talks about Hi-Fi Labs, which is sort of a music-related incubator that he has going on with different projects. Really, you're going to love this one. I guarantee it. Hello. Hey, right on time there. How's your day going? It's going well. How are you, Darren? Excellent. Thank you very much. And getting the housekeeping out of the way, at Water Pumps is the first time that you and your wife have uh, professionally, that's a hard word to say, professionally collaborated. That's right. How long did it take from, hey, we should record something to actually having it out? Uh, 10 years. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we always, we always kind of like talked about doing something together. We've, we've been together for 10 years. Um, maybe like two years ago, we started kicking some ideas around. And, sure. then, uh, and then, you know, once we, once we went on lockdown, um, it seemed like uh, an appropriate time. Sure. And By the way, I apologize if my my wife and kid are in the backyard right now. So <laughs> why well, apologize? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you've always been a uh, kind of what you see is what you get kind of artist. So I don't think that's uh, all planned for you to have a nice trampoline in the background. We got tra- we're basically turning our backyard into Disneyland. So we've got a trampoline. We've got a pool that you can't you can't see currently. Uh, we've got a sandbox. We've got a climbing apparatus. It's you know. By the way, super fortunate to have the space. You know, and the fact that I have my studio out here and they're in the house out there. It's like we're very lucky. Of course, of course. And are you actually based in Atwater, or is that just like a clever name? Yeah, no, we live in Atwater Village in L.A. Yeah. Yeah, we right. love it. it. It was kind of one of those towns that people used to joke about, oh, we're in Atwater. And it kind of became cool. Uh, have you always been there? Because I remember hearing that you used to have a really cool penthouse kind of apartment or, or that in the middle of L.A. I, well, so I had, yes, when I first moved to L.A., um, I moved to West Hollywood, as you do, right? Because... <laughs> you know, that was LA to me, you know, coming from Boston. I had been in Boston for 15 years prior to moving out here. Right. Um, 
So, so yeah, like, you know, my entire world in LA would just revolved around like the Sunset Strip and Melrose, you know what I mean? Like that was it. So I never even came to the East Side till like years later, you know, I remember living in, um, when I lived in, in, uh, in West Hollywood, coming out to like Spaceland for gigs or something. And I just thought, oh my God, it's so far away, you know? And uh, so then, so my wife and I ended up moving to Silver Lake. Right. Um, like whew, six, seven years ago now, I guess. Um, and then, uh, and then we just made the transition down to Atwater here. I mean, it's, you know, it's ostensibly the same neighborhood. Um, just, you know, down here, we're in the flats. Um, we got a little, we get a little more bang for your buck and, you know, we have like sidewalks. My kid can like go skateboarding and scooter cruising on. So, uh, so it re it's really, it really works out great for us. Well, I'll be and sure to, oh. And it's a super creative community too. Like, you know, basically people that live in Atwater Village are like, there's people that have been here their entire lives and like, you know, their families live, you know, on the street over here. My neighbor has lived in this house for 40 years. He grew up in the house on the street behind us. Um, and so it's people that have lived here forever or young families like us that are creative, like our other neighbors are, are TV people. The guy we bought this house from was a, was a TV person. A um, lot of musicians live in the neighborhood, a lot of producers. So it's a really great community. I'm going to be tagging the Atwater Village people in the social media of this because if they need an ambassador, clearly it's you. So, we love it. We're all in. So back to you here. Uh, okay. Of course, I've been following you for decades and you've got this career where you go, is Stacy a drummer slash session guy, a sideman? I don't know. Is he an A&R guy? Is he a songwriter? Is he a producer? Now you have Atwater Punks on that, on top of American Hi-Fi, on top yeah. of Matchbox 20, on top of your Berkeley roots. Yes. It's more convoluted than Butch Walker, I would say at this point. I, I think it is. Who are you? But I, how do you like to be thought of in general? You know, it's funny. I mean, I, I wear a lot of hats and I think it's something that I learned early on in music is that, you know, you have to constantly reinvent, right? You got to stay up on, on what's, you know, what's current. Um, and sometimes that means reinventing what you do. So, you know, I'm a drummer by trade. So if you ask me what I do, you know, as a musician, I'm a drummer. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent guitar player when it comes to like power chords and punk rock chunking, you know, um, not a great singer. I realize that I'm a, I'm a stylist. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Um, but you know, I got a thing, I've got my thing and, 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 and I like that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm a drummer primarily, but, um, but yeah, I've had to, I've had to learn how to produce and how to be a musical director. And I did some A&R for, for Sony for a little while. Um, now I've, I founded a, a, a company called Hi-Fi Labs that we're, we're working with, uh, we're working doing artist development. Mm -hmm but also working to be a creative think tank for just people in the music industry. If you, if you have an idea, you could come to us. We're one stop shop. We can put it together for you using, you know, our network. Um, and so here we are. I'm, you know, that's what, that's what I find myself doing now more than anything um, is uh, re reinventing myself again, because you know, the musical director gig that I've been doing for the last 15 years, that's been my primary sort of day job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that involves live music, right? So it's either performances or television, award shows, you know, things like that. So that, that business is, is clearly, you know, on hold. On hold, yeah, sure. Indefinitely. Um, so one of the things I'm doing now with Hi-Fi Labs is we're really working on the live stream technology and just beefing up what you can do virtually and thinking about different ways to package the live stream and different ways to get a live performance to an audience via the computer, you know, cause that's, that's what we're stuck with right now for live music. Right. Uh, bring it back to what you're talking about with your guitar playing. I remember reading on the first American hi-fi album that you used to, do a drop D on the low string and then just bar your fingers across the top three strings. 
Did you eventually learn how to really play? Did you have to reteach yourself? Uh, yeah, I would say I'm probably a better guitar player than I thought I ever would be. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I practiced a lot, especially in the early hi-fi days. When we were making that album, you know, we, we went, uh, you know, we went, went to Hawaii to make that record with Bob Rock, which was right. incredible. And, um, you know, and these, this was, these were, you know, this was 1998, 99, I guess, when we made that record. Um, so budgets were bigger. Right. Things were different. You know, you just, you, you we, we spent, now granted, we had to take a break in the middle of recording that album because Bob had to go do the Metallica symphony thing. Right. And I'll never forget, he called me, you know, we were literally in the middle of recording that album and Bob called me at the ha up at the house, like kind of early one morning. And I was like, oh shit, this can't be good. You know what I mean? And he's like, hey, I need you to come down, you know, to, I need to chat with you. So I went down to the studio and said, listen, I've got to go do this Metallica thing. And it means we're going to have to pause the rec, you know, the recording process for hi-fi, but you guys stay here. I'm going to give you the keys to the studio. I'm going to keep my engineer here with you guys. And I want you to just keep writing, come to the studio, practice, work on the songs we've already been working on. Uh, you know, he dropped his fee so that we could, we could stay and, you know, like made it really, you know, financially viable for us to stay. So I, I spent that time in between, like really shedding on guitar, writing other songs. I wrote Flavor of the Week during that break, actually. Right. So had we not taken that break, um, th you know, that, that album would have come out without Flavor of the Week on it, which, you know, who knows what sort of path that would have sent us down, whether that's good or bad. You know, some people have debated that. <laughs> um, sure, the, the hit can always be misrepresentative of the rest of the stuff there. And I actually so interviewed Bob last year, and he, when I was asking about people that are a pleasure to work with, he mentioned you. Oh, and, that's awesome. A uh, recurring thing I hear about Stacy Jones in interviews is, oh man, that guy's a great hang. I like working with that guy. So you kind of, it seemed, learned early on that it wasn't just about being a good player, even though you went to Berkeley and you had that training, but it was a good hang thing was going to keep getting you gigs. Do you remember a point in your career where you realized that specifically, that lesson? No, I don't know necessarily that that was ever like a, a, a mindset for me. I think that, um, I think that like I do, I, I'm really I'm psyched to hear that, you know, because I do, I do try to, you know, I try to be a good person in life, in business, family, everything. Um, and I think it's important. I think it's really important. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe once I started getting more into the sideman thing or the gun for hire thing, you, you do start to realize that, um, that the hang is important, right? Because there are, there are a million drummers out there that can play circles around me. You know, I know that. Um, but I think what's important is having your own identity, having sort of your own thing that you do. Um, you know, I'm not a flashy drummer. I, don't, I can't play a lot of the crazy licks and stuff. But... Um, I have a good feel, I have good time. So I sort of lean into that, right? I was like, okay, this makes me, this sort of separates me a little bit from some of the other people. So I'm going to lean into that and, and just go with that. Um, and then, yeah, be, being a good hang is important because once you start getting on the road, you know, you're, you're, you're on packed in airplanes together, you're packed right. in vans together, you're sitting backstage together for hours on end. And it's important that, that you're able to get along. So yes, to your point, I think, yes, having, being a good hang is important. And, um, and I'm, I'm flattered that, that that's my rep. That Bob <laughs> Rock approved. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I mean, Bob has meant so much to me on so many levels. I mean, even before I knew him, you know, as just as a producer, I admired him, right. admired his work. And, and then getting to work with him, and the relationship, you know, that, that I have with him, I talked to him a couple weeks ago on the phone. Um, it's great. He's been a mentor for sure, like hands down. I, I, you know, while we were making that record, and I made a record um, before Hi-Fi with Nina from Veruca yes. Salt. Yeah, great. So album. I was just fly on the wall 
you know, that whole, so I spent 13 months in Maui making those two records. And, um, you know, I took a lot of notes. Let's just put it that way. Right. And as we mentioned, you've also found success as a producer and a songwriter and all that for the other artists. But when you wrote Flavor of the Week, the rumor is that Bob said, we're not going to finish this record unless you put that on the album because you had written that for a potential pop artist or somebody else to cover. Were you in the early days of American Hi-Fi looking to diversify and do other stuff besides being the band? No, not at all. Um, you're right. I did. I wrote Flavor of the Week just sort of on a whim. Um, and I wrote it from the girl's perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so the chorus originally was, my boyfriend, he don't know anything about me. And so I was just, I just happened to be playing that on, on guitar, on an acoustic on the couch. While ja Jamie, I remember so vividly, like Jamie was recording a part, they were messing around with the sound. So we took a break. So I just said, hey, Bob, listen to this. And I started playing it. And he was like, it was like that record, you know, scratch moment. Like, right. wait a minute, hold the phone, play that again. And I played it again. And he's like, that's a hit. He's like, write that from, from the other perspective, Tr flip the perspective, you know? Um, so then I said, her boyfriend, you know, no. and he was like, go home right now, go back to the house. We, so we rented a house. Jamie and I had a house that we lived in together and Drew and Brian lived across this cul-de-sac from us. Right. It was incredible. You know, we just went surfing every morning and went to the studio in the afternoon or played golf. It was incredible. So Bob said, go down to the house, finish these lyrics, you know, this is the, and, and we're going to record it tonight. So we actually stopped what we were doing, reset the room because we weren't set up to record the band. And Bob was like, we're doing this tonight. I was like, okay. So I went, so I went, I went back. The rest of the guys and the engineers stayed at the studio, set up so that we could play live. And I hammered out the lyrics. I didn't finish them, but I got them to you know, a pretty mm -hmm. decent spot. Came back up. We started hammering through it. And we cut basic tracks for Flavor of the Week that night. Wow. Yeah. Well, being super mindful of your time here, a couple quick questions and then you're yeah. a free man and over to the trampoline. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the lineup of Hi-Fi has been really consistent over the years, unlike a lot of your peers. Is that because of a mutual love of Rough Cut? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love that you just referenced Rough Cut. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. I mean, Hi-Fi was started because we were friends. You know what I mean? Like, we never thought that it was going to be a band. I never thought we'd have a song on the radio. I did, it just, you know, it was one of those things that really evolved as I was bored. <laughs> I came back to Boston from a Veruca Salt tour. I had been practicing some guitar right. while I was playing with Veruca Salt. And I just said, hey, let's, let's go to the letter. You know, we went to the Letters to Cleo rehearsal space down in the South End. I called up Kay and Mike and said, hey, can we go use the space? And they said, sure, because I still had a key for it. So we went down and just played cheap trick tunes and like drank beer. And, you know, it turned into a, it turned into a thing that we just, we never, we never saw it coming. So, so yeah, so Hi-Fi has been the same guys. We've had, uh, you know, Jason Sutter subbed on drums for, for a little while when Brian had his first kid. Um, and, um, and then I think we've had a couple subs here and there when, when people have had, you know, babies basically. Right. Um, otherwise it's been, it's been the four guys and, and we just released, um, you know, a, a cover of, uh, Stepping Out by Joe Jackson. Great that stuff. is, you know, going to be part of this covers EP that w that's coming out later. Um, and so, yeah, it's the same, the same dudes. And it's, it's nice to have that in my life. You know, it, uh, it's really nice to be able to, get together with guys that are fam, they're like family to me. You know, we've known each other for 20 plus years now. And to still be able to make music and put something out and, um, you know, just do it on our own terms. It's, you know, I know it's a luxury. Is there more music coming from Atwater Punk soon? I, you know what, I don't know. Um, probably not anytime real soon. Um, but I think uh, we've been, my wife and I have been talking about doing a cover maybe. Um, and we've been kicking around some bands, but I think we're sort of landing on maybe doing a replacements tune, Ooh. which I think would be cool. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, there, there, we might, we might do something like that in the near cool. future. Uh, there's a rumor that I heard that you tried out for the band, the candy butchers. Is that true? You know what? I don't know that I tried out for the candy butchers, but I did, j I have jammed with Mike Viola back in Boston a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I love, I obviously I love that band and I love Mike. He's incredible. I, everything he does, you know, uh, I think is brilliant. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I did, I, you know, maybe it was an audition and I didn't know it. I didn't, I didn't get the gig. I'll tell you that much. Things worked out just fine for you and, <laughs> and all that. So in closing, Stacy, uh, any last words for the kids? Oh man. Boy, I mean, it's a, t it, this is a tough time to, to try to have a statement to the kids. I think, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, if you, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic and everyone, you know, is just trying to figure out like how to, how, how are we moving forward? And with everything, you know, with all the racial injustice that's going on in the world, it's a heavy time. Yeah. You know? And, um, I think that, I think it's a good time to be creative. Um, I think, I think the world needs that. And I think that there, there can be a lot of change through creativity and people's art. Um, and man, it's tough. I, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that, for that question. <laughs> it, we can it, edit around that one if needed. No, it's fine. I, no, I just mean it's so heavy. Like I, I like, I don't think I could, articulate everything I want to say in a closing statement, you know, cause there's just so much going on. I mean, um, wow. Yeah. Wow. That, that one, that one, you got me on that one. Usually, <laughs> usually I have an answer for everything. Well, Hey, if it wasn't evident, uh, thank you for your time. Long time fan. I was at that oh. where you guys opened for super drag at the Bowery ballroom. Oh man. You guys gave me a wonderful interview 20 years ago on Long Island where we talked about rough cut a lot. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for your time and really looking forward to more music, whatever banner it comes out through. Oh, thanks Dan. Last but not least, and I really feel hesitant to even justify saying last but not least, is my interview with Tommy Lee. That Tommy Lee indeed, the drummer of Motley Crue, took about 40 minutes to speak with me. And this one, like the Stacey Jones chat, the video of it is on YouTube. So if you want to see some of the visuals of what he's talking about, you can. Tommy has a new album called Andro in the works. I say in the works because it has a release date, but you can only get two of the tracks right now. Both of those tracks had music videos that were directed by Fred Durst. Yes, that Fred Durst. I do hope to eventually get Fred Durst on this podcast. I've interviewed one or two of his bandmates before. But anyway, Tommy is somebody that I've been a fan of since I was in elementary school. I know that sounds freaky to say, but if you think about how many years ago Dr. Feelgood was that was a long time ago so i think my enthusiasm comes through on this one this is almost turned into a little bit of a fanboy episode but what can i say it's tommy lee he's one of the greatest drummers in the history of rock my opinion still doing interesting things and i was blown away to see how nice and relaxed and patient he was with me asking a bunch of questions that were not related to one another I'd wanted to interview a member of Motley Crue for many years, so it was absolutely worth the wait. This has been the longest episode of the Paltrowcast yet, I believe, <laughs> but <laughs> if you've made it this far, enjoy. Tommy, how's it going there today? Good, guys. How's it going? Great. Thank you very much. The, the first thing I want to know, does anyone call you Tom or is it just Tommy to everybody? Only when they're mad at me. <laughs> Tom? Hey, Tom? There you go. Actually, um, my mom used to just call me Tom when she was mad, but that's about it. <laughs> and I'm calling you Tommy because I'm not mad at you today. And Thank you. <laughs> congratulations on getting some great new music out there. I've only heard two tracks from Andro. Is the whole thing done and mastered and the artwork's complete? Yep, everything's done. It sounds insane. Um, 
and I released two singles at once so that people could really get a feel for um, the, the, the vibe of the record because uh, one side of the record is completely female energy driven and the other side of the record is male energy driven. So I figured uh, releasing two at once would give people, a, I don't know, a, a, a little taste of what, uh, you know, what the, the whole thing is about. Sure, and Push Push represents some of that great female energy. How did you encounter her? She, I, I've been following her for a while. She has done some pretty amazing stuff. Um, she's on my list of collaborators. I've got a, a, an ongoing list of people that I would love to work with. So um, she was one of them, and when I wrote the track, uh, she was the first one that came to mind. I was like, oh, my God, she will absolutely kill this track. Right. And, and uh, I sent it to her, and she's like, I'm on my way. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's kind of how a lot of the collaborations happened, you know. Music was written, and in my mind, uh, I'd be like, whoa, this person would just kill this. This is perfect for them. And that's kind of how the whole process has happened pretty organically. And I see you've got Josh Todd on the album and Lucas Rossi kind of all over the place in the best of kind of ways. Was it that you reach out to somebody when I got something for you and then you'd send ideas back and forth or was it mostly sent finished tracks? Um, pretty much finished tracks. I mean, Josh really, Josh, I can't say he's like on the record as he's not uh, singing or anything on the track. It, he left me a really, fucked up voice message one day <laughs> and and it's just it's such a great segue uh into a track called uh caviar on a paper plate it's a mickey avalon uh track and i just i was like hey josh can i use this because this is just this just sets the track up perfectly um so he's just kind of a a, a little uh, i guess interlude uh whatever but um yeah as far as like uh lucas I've, I've always loved Lucas. I mean, we picked him in rock, rock star supernova because he was, right. he was the best by far. And, um, he, uh, uh, had, he came to me with this idea of, um, doing a, a Prince cover, which interestingly, in, interestingly enough, the song was really, I mean, uh, it, it's called when you were mine. And it's a really kind of a fast poppy, like when you were mine. It's really, it's really up tempo. But we slowed it down and made it so. Uh, I don't want to say dark. It's just super sexy. It's way, way beautiful. I'm really excited for people to hear that. And of course, he sings his ass off on it. There's these beautiful high. Prince you falsetto things that are just like, oh my God, listen to that. Right. The uh, yeah. way that you met Lucas, as you mentioned, was Supernova, and that led to you working with Butch Walker on that show and then also on Good Times. So kind of your career has been pretty linear in, in some ways. Somebody like Fred Durst, you worked with him on Methods of Mayhem, and then he directed these two music videos. Yeah. So it seems like you send out holiday cards and <laughs> keep in touch with people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are, uh, you know, uh, 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 a lot of the collaborations are, are new, and I've gone back to some, some older friends because, um, like for Fred Durst, for instance, I sent him the record um, because he came to mind because he was shooting uh, two videos also, one being that you know, uh, tops, which is, you know, more hip hop or, 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 mm -hmm. or a rappy kind of vibe and, uh, knock me down being super heavy. Fred is the only guy on the planet that I know that gets both of those. And I sent him the tracks and he was like, Oh dude, these are fire. Let me at them. I'm, he, I, I, I can, I, you know, th this is right up my alley. So, uh, it was a perfect choice. You know, he's, he gets, he gets all of it. And he did both the music videos on those album. Uh, yes. That said it come out. Was he just your first go-to? Like, Fred's going to get the music, therefore he's going to get the visuals too? 
Pretty, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there, the, nobody else came to mind. I don't know anybody. And Fred being an artist, he understands where I'm coming from and what I'd like to convey. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, picture, <laughs> excuse me, picture wise. <laughs> um, so he, he was the, the first and only guy to, that I went to and I, and I knew we'd do some great stuff together, you know? And your name just always stays in the headlines for one reason or another. And Post Malone song, Tommy Lee. <laughs> when you record on that, did you know that the song was called Tommy Lee? Or did he just say, hey, lay some grooves down on this? Well, here's, I got to clear this up because uh, in another interview, I think there was some uh, com uh, miscommunication. The, the song that just came out yesterday, um, from Tyla and Post, uh, I am not on that track. I am working on, and uh, I will be done by, I think, Tuesday. Um, I'm working on a remix of it um, where I've, I've put my flavors all over it and uh, turned it into something, uh, something really cool that I think everyone's going to dig. So I, I did not play on the uh, original track that's, that's out or came out last night. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. But I've, I've played on Post, Post Malone's uh, uh, previous album before. Um, right. Not, not this track, not the Tommy Lee track uh, in particular. But how rad is that, dude? Wow, that's like the, the, the ultimate, you know, homage or whatever. The that, that, that is the word. You, you picked the exact word there, homage. And you yeah. even without the uh, H pronounced right there. Yeah, homage. <laughs> homage, yeah. The homage. It's, it's so crazy, man. I'm, I mean, I'm honored. And I think that's just, uh, it, I almost don't know what to say, you know? It's Thank a, you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And where's my publishing? Yeah. Thanks guys. That's super rad. <laughs> well, you yourself as a writer, the first time I ever got a hint for you being electro influenced was Planet Boom. What was the oh. band that really hooked you into EDM or industrial music was it ministry? Um, it you know what the, several several things. I mean, you God, there's ministry, the prodigy, Nine Inch Nails. I could go on. Um, and the, you know, I as a drummer, from as long as I can remember, uh, even as a little kid, listening to you know rock and roll from Zeppelin to the Gap Band. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I just being a drummer, I'm always going to gravitate towards the beat. And if the beat is funky or if it's heavy, I'm all over it. So I've just been inspired at, at a young age to by all kinds of genres of music. So for me, the, you know, I know people trip out sometimes. They're like, yeah, but he plays drums in Motley Crue, but I'm... <laughs> I'm really, really, really inspired and influenced by s several genres of music. So, um, you know, I gotta, I gotta play, I gotta play with everything. You know what I mean? Why would I just do one thing? There's the, that become pretty boring if you ask me. Well, yeah, there, there's a rumor or at least a line that's been attributed to you. I think it was in the dirt where you said that you wish that Motley Crue could have toured with cool bands like Husker Du and Iggy Pop. Is that true or is that a misquoted thing? Uh, no, that's true. I'm, you know, we've always tried to um, turn our fans on to something new. I mean, we've got, I remember bringing, I remember this was before anyone even knew who Guns N' Roses was. Right. People were out in the audience going like, who are these guys? They're, they're, they're kind of dope <laughs> you know what i mean like i i, I just uh, i remember that so we were trying to turn people on to what we thought was cool we brought bands even from a from the other side of the of the genre a, a band called head pe which is some sure. serious, serious you know you know rock rack uh, uh rap stuff um jesus we brought a dj out <clears throat> on a tour to play uh, to turn people on to some new you probably cheap trick out <laughs> cheap, cheap trick which you know uh, which was to me 
probably one of the craziest days ever, sitting on the side of the stage, watching Cheap Trick go on uh, as our special guests. And I'm just sitting there going, I just never thought that day would ever, ever, ever come. Here's somebody who I've idolized forever. These guys like shaped me in, in many ways with their insane, beautiful, you know, anthemic melodies and mm -hmm. just their vibe and everything. And I'm watching these guys open up for us going, what is happening right now? <laughs> Somebody pinch me, please. Well, the thing that you just mentioned a minute ago, uh, have you ever heard of the professional wrestler Diamond Dallas Page, DDP? It's okay if you haven't. I, I can't say I have. Okay, well, earlier today I was speaking with him, and I said, have you ever met Tommy? I'm speaking with him later today. And he goes, oh, my God, this one time in Florida, this club I was running, we brought on, uh, he brought on Guns N' Roses, and we didn't know who they were. So it's that exact thing that you just talked about. I think you changed uh, a lot of lives with that. That's cool, man. I love that. You know, an even better story that you, that you might like is Nikki Six and I brought the, the guy responsible for signing Motley Crue, we brought him to the Roxy to come see this band called Guns N' Roses. And... And Nikki and I were like, dude, you got to sign these guys. I'm telling you, they're going to fucking blow up. Mm -hmm. And Tom passed on them. And, they, and, and Geffen signed them. And to this day, he's probably, you know, still punching himself <laughs> upside the head. Even, um, I don't know. We just, you know, uh, you know I, I feel like we have a... a uh, you know, a, a good barometer on what people uh, will dig. And, and, and I try, I do that with my music. You know, I, I think I've made a record that is, there's something for everybody on it. It's one of those where I'm like, oh, how could you not like this, man? If you're a girl, you're going to love this. If you're a dude, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to lose your mind. You know what I mean? Like, so, <clears throat> I don't know, man, you know, and, and I'm a big, a big fan of, uh, of, uh, of the underdog, you know? Um, there's so many talented people out there, bro, that, that will, may never see the light of day. And if, if I can be of some sort of platform for, you know, uh, an, an artist out there that, that, that I think it, everyone should know about, God, let's go, come on, you know? Right. It's, it's been that way with you for a long time. Your studio records have always kind of brought up younger artists or hungry artists and you've always welcomed co-writes at the same time smash yeah. company seated a drummer who should do it tommy lee he's there but yeah. have you actually turned down a lot of things over the years because it sounds like you've said yes to most things out of nature yeah, I, yeah well the things you hear about i said yes to um but yeah there's, there's times where i mean i get asked all the time to play uh on people's records and my first uh, answer is, can I hear the track? Because um, it's real important to me to, uh, if I'm going to bring something to the party, I, I got to be into it. And if I'm not quite thinking like, man, I don't know if I can, I can bring this up to, you know, a certain level, or if it's just not there, it's not there. I, you know, I, I, I you know, graciously, uh, you know, bow out but um you know and 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 i do that when i uh collaborate with other artists like for instance uh uh one of the songs on the andro record uh it's called uh make it back and I, the, the this girl julia who's in the group uh, playa i sent her two tracks and and i i just i do this with a lot of people uh i I don't, I would never want to force something on somebody like, I really want you on this track and kind of give them options. Like, what are you feeling? What's, what's moving you, you know, because that's what I want is I want, I, I want you to be moved by something to be like, Oh my God, I, I gotta, I gotta get on this. So with her, uh, I sent her several tracks and she picked the one I, I, I thought she, that she would pick. And, and there, then, I got an amazing performance out of her 
uh, because she was into it. So I, I just think that's really important when you're collaborating also is to let the, the person that you're, or the people that you're collaborating with, everybody's like, you know, they're into it and it's not something that's forced because nothing at the end of the day is going to come, uh, good's going to come from that. Right. I've heard yeah. you can get 10 different answers on this if you ask 10 different people. Do yeah. you let your wife hear the rough mixes and the demos or do you just play her the finished goods? Uh, uh, she, well, I mean, she's, she's always around. So she hears it going down and, you know, uh, I, I don't think, uh, I can't recall her ever saying, oh, the demo was better. She, <laughs> she, she, you know, um, I can't recall that ever happening. I'm such a tweaker that um, I try to make that my, you know, my goal is to, to obviously have the, the demo not even, even be considered. That's the end result should be like, oh my God, this smokes the demo, you know? So, so far so good. <laughs> now, one of the things that you're most famous for, musically speaking, is the drum sounds that you got on Dr. Feelgood. And without that, there's no black album from Metallica. Without no black album, there's no metal <laughs> streaming, I guess we can say. Do you spend a lot of time still on getting tone? Yeah, like uh, just uh, just laid some uh, some drums down on this new uh, Post Malone remix, that Tommy Lee track. And we spent two days um, making sure um, not only that the drums sound the best they can possibly sound, but do they sound right for the track? I mean, that's important because you can sit there and spend weeks on a snare drum sound, but if it doesn't fit into the track, yeah, the snare drum sounds great, but is it musical? Does it sing in the track? You know, do the toms sing in the track? Mm -hmm. Are, are they tuned note wise to you know to the track? A lot of times you'll hear a bass drum and it just goes boom, but mm -hmm. does but does it go boom in the, right, <laughs> in, in the right key? And those things are so important, and those are overlooked by uh, a lot of drummers. We're just going like, oh, I just want my drums to sound badass. Well, badass is cool, but is it musical? So I try to I try to keep things as musical as possible, all you know as well. Yeah, of course. Your Bonham meets Alex Van Halen meets your own thing over the years. And you also, can I keep complimenting you or do I have to stop? I can't gauge if you can take compliments. You can keep them coming, man. I love it. I okay. love it. <laughs> so you're one of the people that kind of made it cool to play piano uh, within the hard rock genre. Growing up, kids don't want to play the piano. They want to play the guitar. But then they hear... Home Sweet Home, and they hear some of the Motley Crue deep cuts, like, uh, is it You're All That I Need, or? They, yeah, You're All I Need, yep. Yeah, they hear that stuff, they go, oh, someone cool plays piano, maybe I can too. Does, has anyone ever asked you to play piano on a record besides Motley Crue? Um, no, but, um, yeah, because that's probably not primarily what I'm, I'm known for, but um, I have received some uh some compliments and one being from axel rose which was was amazing he's a great guy and for him to come out and say that uh that, you know when tommy played a piano during home sweet home that was my main inspiration for november rain wow yeah and you heard when, that when he said that i was like whoa dude that's really sweet that's really cool man um so technically I've never played piano on, not that I know of, I'm trying to think now, have I? I don't think so, but, but, uh, but have received many compliments on it. And I, and I think that's cool and you're right. As a kid, um, this is funny because as a kid, I'm t you know, you're taking piano lessons and my parents were pretty strict about like, until you do your, your daily, you know, you, you've got your exercises, your finger exercises and stretches and scales and all this shit that you got to do. Right. Um, I wasn't really allowed to go out and, and, uh, and uh, you know, wreak havoc with my, my, my friends until I was done. And it was just turned into this like, oh God, I got to do this again. And, and, 
it, at the moment it just sounds like torture and you're like, I just want to play drums. Yeah. Like this is piano. This is like, this sucks. <laughs> um, but at the, uh, you know, there, 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 there came a moment where, um, you know, I, I thanked my parents. I'm like, you know, I got to thank you guys for making me practice and, and, and be vigilant about, you know, what it was that, you know, I mean, I did want to, I wanted to take piano lessons, but then it started to become really difficult and it was a lot, it's a lot of work, but it's such a beautiful instrument. And I, th I thank them later for, for, for being like, you know, being uh, firm with me on it because it's a, it's, it's an instrument I can walk up to at any time and uh, either make somebody cry <laughs> or make them happy. Like, it's just, it's such a be powerful, beautiful instrument, man. I, I love the piano. Um, well, what more can I say about that? It's just, it's a, I, I think, I think piano is a, 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 maybe more so than guitar, a really cool instrument for a, a child learning music to, to start with. Well, yeah. bringing, bringing things in a totally different direction here, uh, you were, were the first guest on Sammy Hagar's Traveling Rock Show, and we saw you cooking in the kitchen. Are <laughs> you regularly a cook, or is it the kind of thing where you can cook one or two dishes to impress a lady, and then you let that one lie? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I, I, I love to cook. Um, I just saw Sammy a couple of days ago. Uh, he's doing really well. Uh, um, I love that guy. Uh, no, I love to cook, man. My, 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 my Greek mother, um, it, it, you know, she, she taught me a lot and I, I, I love it. My father cooked also, not all the time. He would mostly cook like all the big holiday kind of dinners and stuff, but I love to cook, man. I love, it's that, and maybe even more than cooking, it, I, I enjoy the, the time it's like this weird quiet time of just like preparing and chopping and you know getting things ready and prepping and kind of tasting as you're going that whole kind of ritual is really like uh i don't know i just you just get to check out for a while does that make any sense <laughs> that makes a lot of sense uh my wife who's gladly listening and nodding uh gets the meditative purposes of of cooking all that but that also sounds like the drummer kind of approach where people don't know all the stuff that you're doing but you take pride in what you're doing and usually it's the drummer in the band who likes to drive the van and do the loadouts and tech their own stuff was that you in the early days <laughs> totally totally the guy who's like i don't know holding down the fort man he's that guy <laughs> and you mentioned uh your greek heritage and one of the things i was going to ask you later is When's the last time you spoke Greek? I went, um, not this summer, last summer um, uh, with a couple of friends and we, uh, we, uh, we yachted around the Greek islands. So it was just uh, last summer. And it's one of those things like, you know, when my mother was alive, she would talk to me uh, a lot in Greek and I would kind of keep up my, my, my Greek uh, chops. Sure. And if you, you know, like anything, if you don't do it a lot, you start to forget, but it's like a bike once you get back on it, you know, you're like, oh, oh, that's right, that's right. So, I don't know, a few days into the, into the Greek island trip, I was like, okay, that's right, that's right. I forgot to say that. <laughs> it, all, it all starts to come back, but yeah, like a year ago, or less, yeah, less somewhere. And is Greek cooking your specialty? It's one of them. Um, my mom taught me, uh, it's one of my favorite dishes and it's, it's, it's the go-to dish when you're not feeling well. I guess it would be the uh, American version of like a, like a chicken soup or a matzo ball kind of a, a soup. It's one when you're not feeling well. It's just one of those, I, I just, it always makes you feel good. It's called, it's called avgola lemono, which means it's an egg and lemon uh, soup, but with chicken and uh orzo uh it's like a little looks like a r little fatter rice 
I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, but. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done my Greek food time. I mean, you live in New oh. York. If you don't eat Greek food, oh, then, oh, get yeah. to New York. <laughs> then, you, then you know. Then you know. Yeah. The, um, so, so that stuff. Um, oh, uh, of course, uh, 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 lamb souvlaki. Um, you know, you marinate that the day before. Um, all, I have recipes from her that, are, that I've saved, um, that I've... I, I still use today, so I love I love cooking, man. It's a cool, uh, it's a cool indoor sport. <laughs> and I have to ask you then: Is it gyro or gyro? For the record, it's gyro. Okay, it's gyro. Tommy, I mean, I, it's, so, <laughs> it's so funny when they when people call it a gyro. I, I I know it's spelt like that, and that's phonetically what I guess what it. I mean, sorry, not phonetically. Phonetically is what it sounds like. Uh, what it looks like is gyro, but it's it's like the 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 g the g isn't pronounced with the j. It's it's like more like an like an h, hero, right. or right. e or an h hero. And then also in the food space, one of the most infamous things about you is that MTV Cribs, where you showed that you had a Starbucks in your home. Is that still in effect? Are you still a franchisee? Of course, it's still here. Um, I actually, I just switched over because, um, I, I'm drinking, this is actually, it's kind of my new jam. I just found out about these. I learned about it on the golf cart, on the golf course. It's called a transfusion. It's ginger ale with a little splash of, uh, grape juice. Uh, but that's like a virgin, uh, transfusion a real one would have vodka in it but this is a virgin <laughs> and um uh so i just switched over i've had a couple of cappuccinos this morning but yes starbucks is still it's actually right next to the studio door it's right outside the studio <laughs> were and, you the only celebrity in dorsey to ever get that because i don't think i've ever read about anyone else having that you, you know it was a weird thing i remember um my, I, I lived uh, up in in, uh, in, uh, in 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 Malibu at the top of Mulholland, and like to go down to Starbucks is literally a, like a twenty minute trek down to Starbucks and twenty minutes back. It's like a forty minute run to go get a freaking coffee, and and I, I think I was just complaining one day because I I was tired of doing that. And I was just complaining one day to my accountant. I was like, God, man, I would just kill if there was a Starbucks that was closer or if I had one in my house. I was just like bullshitting, really. And he goes, oh, well, I, I, I represent, uh, you know, several of the, the Starbucks chains. And I was like, what? He goes, well, let, me, let me make some phone calls and see if I can just get the, the people that actually do the installs with the machinery you know, like, I don't want to open up a Starbucks at my house, but the, to get the machinery and everything uh, in, he made a couple of calls and boom, they came over and installed the machines, the grinders, the pump, the flavors, the, you, you name it, the whole deal. And they brought me like the green Starbucks apron and shit. And I was like, it's legit Starbucks downstairs here. <laughs> it's crazy. All I can say to that is just, Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, the apron, I've never seen photos of that, but that should be in a music video eventually. Yeah, I usually don't wear the apron, but it's, it's fun to have. <laughs> well, a bunch of random questions here, being respectful of your time, because, again, when you say, I'm talking to Tommy, everyone in the world's a Motley Crue fan, whether or not they admit it outright. So, uh, so first thing is, how many WrestleManias have you attended? How many WrestleManias? Yes. Um, well, one we played. Um, and as far as going, attending it and being, being there live, I, that's the only, I think that's the only time was when we played. The rest of the time I'm attending, but watching it from television, you know. Okay, now we talked before about how you speak Greek and you pick it up and all that. Now, David Lee Roth recorded a whole album uh, in Spanish. He recorded Eat Em and Smile in Spanish, his Sonrisa Salvaje. I heard about that. 
I heard about that, and I think that's so cool. I was I was really impressed by that. That's how cool is that? Well, will we ever see a Greek language recording from you? Well, um, that's interesting. That would be cool. Um, that, that's interesting. I mean, I never thought about doing that, but why not? Shit, why not? Maybe. Okay. You never know. You never know. <laughs> you heard it first. Yeah. Um, another thing that's awesome about you is that your athletic background a lot of it comes from ballet. Did ballet have a big correlation to your drumming and the discipline involved in being physical but mental at the same time? Uh, more, uh, more so tap dancing, because that's super, super rhythmic. Um, I guess ballet, um, I think one of the reasons I chose ballet, which I, uh, uh, yeah, What's what could possibly be wrong with dancing with girls, right? I, I, I guess I just wasn't one of those guys who you know uh, was like a, like a, you know a sports guy and hanging out with dudes in the locker room like I did. I, I, I preferred and I got trust me I got a lot of shit um, right by my peers for taking tap and ballet. Um, and so much peer pressure at a young age like that, it, it made me quit. Um, Cause I, I just, there was a, a, there was a picture in the local paper at a, at a dance recital and here I am in my tights. And, but I'm, I'm with this beautiful girl. And I think the, I remember going to school the next day and these people are going, like, Dude, what, are, what are you a fag? And I was like, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I, hold on, hold on. If, if we're talking about fags, you're playing football, spanking each other on the on the on the ass. I, I think you, there's some confusion here, fellas. <laughs> you know, and not that that's gay, but I'm just, you know, what I'm saying. Like, that. and I I got so much pressure that I just said, "Fuck it, I quit." Well, it's come out that Mick Jagger learned his breathing exercises from ballet, and Kip Winger. I've heard similar things. Have other people confided in you, like, "Hey, man, I did ballet too." You know what? Uh, um, a few people have, and more so, I've read a, a ton of running backs uh, in 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 in, uh, in football uh, take ballet for you know for agility and speed and and finesse and moves and uh, and that it didn't surprise me, but it surprised me that they would say would you know be public about that. You think they would get like I got flack for it, but apparently those guys don't give a shit, which is cool. <laughs> totally. And there is uh, two quick questions and then you're a free man. The first one is there's a player in the New Orleans Saints named Tommy Lee Lewis. First name is Tommy Lee. Has that hit your radar at all? I've seen that and I'm, that's so right. I'm like, no way. Look at that. That's cool. I love it. I love it. Exactly. Okay, cool, man. So in closing, any last words for the kids? Uh, for the kids, um, man, hang in there. We're going through some crazy times. Um, uh, the Buddhists would say nothing, nothing is forever. Um, uh, what else? What else, man? I, I hope you, I hope you all enjoy the, the record that I made because I made it for myself and I made it for you guys and, uh, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you stay safe happy healthy and um and i will see you next summer right around this time uh in a stadium near you <laughs> exactly hope to see that hope to see andro on tour thank you so much for your time in the decades of great great music tommy thank you brother Bye, thank you thanks for checking out the paltrow cast with darren paltrowitz produced by v13 media Theme song by Steve Schiltz. Audio mixing by Mark Pirro. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Outro.